If you discuss the climate crisis with someone, either online or IRL, you might have heard them say something like this. Hey, everybody, listen up. I got it. Supersonic magnets. Ah, yes. Techno-optimism. The belief that all problems, even ecological ones, have a technological solution. That some brilliant billionaire entrepreneur, probably Elon Musk, will invent a profitable machine that will solve everything. So don't even worry about it. Many, perhaps even most, believe this to some extent. That the solution to the climate crisis will be fundamentally technological. That it's simply a question of switching from one source of energy to another. From fossil to renewable. That's certainly something that we must do. But framing the climate crisis as just a technical problem is misguided and misses the bigger picture. But more on that later. First, let's run down a few commonly touted techno fixes. Fusion energy. Fusion energy is, very briefly put, about trying to imitate the physics of the sun here on Earth in order to create endless clean energy. If you want more detail, there's a Kurzgesagt video about it. So, endless clean energy. Sounds great, right? However, there's a running gag among engineers about fusion energy. The technology's been 10 years away for about 6 decades now. It's proven very difficult and very expensive to pull off, and it may never amount to more than just extravagant physics experiments. Even if fusion energy ever becomes feasible, the most optimistic forecasts still put it decades away from being commercially viable by which time we need to be at zero carbon emissions anyway. I'm a humanities dum-dum, so for all the techno babbly reasons why fusion energy may never work, I recommend this video. I'm not completely discounting fusion energy. I mean, if we need a World War II style mobilization to beat climate change, then uh, fusion energy might very well be our Manhattan project. But counting on it saving our asses? Don't. Fusion energy is trying to solve a very difficult problem with an even more difficult problem. But what about a more proven technology, like nuclear energy? Many insist that going all in on nuclear is our only realistic option, and they tend to dismiss the anti-nuclear crowd as uninformed or hysterical, because nuclear is totes the safest form of energy around, the death toll is very low, and it's abundant. I mean, hello? Unlike quite a few environmentalists, I'm not categorically against nuclear. Like, it's certainly better than its reputation, even though that doesn't take a lot. The risk of a meltdown is indeed low, and it is a low carbon form of energy. And right now we need as much clean energy as we can get, which is why I'm not very keen on closing down nuclear power plants unless they pose an immediate safety hazard, beyond the theoretical chance of a meltdown, that is. But as a solution to the climate crisis, it's a dead end. The problem is that nuclear power plants take a dang long time to build. If we want to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, and trust me, we do, then we need to cut carbon emissions in half by 2030. Nuclear can do basically nada to curb emissions in that time. The plants are also very expensive to build, so that's two major disadvantages they have compared with solar and wind. And yes, the radioactive waste is a problem, despite what the nuclear bros might insist. That shit is dangerous for thousands and thousands of years. Did you know that they're designing nightmare architecture around the radioactive waste facilities? Like basically creating survival horror levels out of them, specifically in order to keep future people from snooping around? There's a very good Jacob Geller video about it. Also, I don't hear many people talk about this, but in a future with more storms and heat waves and droughts and floods, is it really such a good idea to have a massively expanded fleet of nuclear power plants and waste facilities around? I mean, remember that the Fukushima disaster was caused by a tsunami. At the very least, we need to be careful about where we build these things. Again, not completely against nuclear, I can see it acting well as a backup to more intermittent renewables, but it's not the silver bullet to climate change that some people are making it out to be. It's bad enough when regular Joes and Joannes get entranced by dubious technofixes, but it gets downright scandalous when even scientists at the IPCC get into it. I mentioned earlier that we need to cut carbon emissions in half by 2030 to make the 1.5 degree target, and that's of course from the now infamous IPCC special report from October 2018, where they also said that doing this entails 
unprecedented transitions in all aspects of society. Now, the scientists aren't stupid, and after three decades of conferences and reports and little progress, they don't understand how politics work, or rather, don't work. So they're like, there's a good chance that the whole unprecedented transitions in all aspects of society thing isn't gonna happen, so who's up for a plan B? Most of the scenarios in that 2018 report actually have us exceeding the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. How can that be? Enter Bioenergy with Carbon Capture and Storage, or BEX for short. The idea behind BEX is simple. Grow a lot of trees, which will suck carbon out of the atmosphere, cut down the trees and burn them for energy while capturing the carbon emissions, which you then store underground. That way you have negative emissions, and so we could exceed our carbon budget without much problem. Now, we should absolutely plant trees, lots of them. Trees are good. I like trees. However, BEX is a speculative, unproven technology that we have no idea whether it will work at scale or not. These massive monoculture tree plantations would require a lot of land, two to three times the size of India. They would also require a lot of water, they would compete with farmland, they could lead to imperialistic land grabs, they would devastate ecosystems, and there are no guarantee against triggering tipping points and feedback loops if we overshoot the carbon budget, which BEX gives us an excuse to do. In other words, BEX is a huge gamble with our future. Yet, in IPCC's last assessment report, the one from 2014, 101 out of 116 scenarios relied heavily on BEX to keep warming below 2 degrees centigrade, never mind 1.5. BEX has come under heavy scrutiny, and even the guy who came up with the idea in the first place has criticized scientists for misusing it in their models. In fact, the October 2018 report was a response to these critiques, an attempt to figure out what it would take to tackle the climate crisis without using BEX. But still, only one scenario in that report went completely without it. I hope I made a convincing case that techno-optimism could just as well be called techno-naivete. But you might argue that, sure, these specific technologies are probably bunk, but that's no reason to diss on technology in general. Which is fair, and I want to stress that I'm not a Luddite. Please ignore the fact that I cited the video by a channel called Tech for Luddites. Nor am I, god forbid, an Amprim. I don't hate technology. I mean, that would be hypocritical. Like, I'm shooting this with a camera, I'm recording sound with a microphone, which is connected to my smartphone, I'm using lights, and I'll edit this on a laptop, and upload it to the internet, and uh, even my glasses is a form of technology. Technology will be vital, indeed essential, to tackling the climate crisis. But again, reducing the climate crisis to a technical problem is unwise. So beyond betting on specific techno fixes that don't work, what are the dangers of techno-optimism? For one, it could breed complacency. If you want nothing but positive climate news, then tech news has you covered. Solar and wind are getting cheaper, more efficient, and widespread. Electric cars kick ass. We're finding new ways to sequester carbon. We're making breakthroughs with battery storage. We're developing new technologies like solar-powered desalination. Great, maybe we can drink the sea level rise way. Following tech news could lead you to believe that we've got this climate change thing in the bag. I mean, Elon Musk is on the case. Besides, I'm a humanist dum-dum, there's, there's nothing I can do without an engineering degree, so... That could keep you from getting engaged, and we still need people getting engaged. Billionaires won't save us. We must save us. Second danger. Framing the climate crisis as a technical problem needing technological solutions risks giving fossil fuel companies an excuse to keep emitting carbon. Companies like BP and Total, Shell, Chevron, they've invested in stuff like carbon capture and storage and direct air capture. And while I support these technologies, we should question the involvement of fossil fuel companies. Now, you could argue that this is the polluter pays principle in practice that by funding carbon capture technologies, fossil fuel companies are drawing down carbon they previously emitted. They're cleaning up after themselves. Isn't that what the climate justice crowd wants? But then you read about how they used that captured carbon. They inject it into depleted oil fields so they can extract even more oil. What an innovative way to create more carbon emissions. 
I would expect nothing less from the companies that spent millions of dollars over several decades lobbying politicians and hiring fake experts, using the strategy that was so successful with the tobacco companies, to obscure and so doubt about the very fact of global warming and climate change, all to maximize profit. But even if it weren't for all this nonsense, the total carbon capture capability of CCS and direct air capture today is puny, nowhere near enough to make much of a difference on its own. And it's really expensive. You're better off planting lots of trees. But then also not burning them, please. With all that said, there's no reason we shouldn't have more carbon capture and storage. I would like to emphasize that part. Carbon capture and storage, not carbon capture and emitting again to emit even more. CCS and DAC can be a small part of the solution, but it can't save the world, nor should it save the fossil fuel companies. The third danger I see with techno-optimism is that we risk getting distracted from the systemic causes of the climate crisis and of being dismissive toward those that draw attention to them. Some people go, why is Greta Thunberg getting so much attention for whining and skipping school while Boyan Slots, who actually invented something and has a solution, is being ignored? He's not being ignored, he's getting a lot of media coverage. I want to say I'm rooting for the Ocean Cleanup Project. I think it's cool and I hope it and the plastic collecting machine succeeds. Because the more plastic we can clean out of the oceans, the less marine wildlife will choke on it. However, it's more important to stop plastic from getting into the ocean in the first place. And they are trying to do that, to their credit. The OCP has had its successes, like collecting microplastic as small as one millimeter, it has also been beset by technical difficulties, which is of course to be expected, no technology is excellent right away. But that's precisely a relevant point regarding any unproven technofix we decide to bet on for solving the crisis. All technological development hit unforeseen snags. So be patient, I guess? But how patient? We only have a decade or two to deal with the crisis. We need to do more than just wait around for technology. Every year, 8 million tons of plastic enter our oceans, a figure expected to increase to 29 million tons by 2040. Currently, there's about 150 million metric tons of plastic in the oceans, and by 2040 it could be 600 million. Some scientists are skeptical of the feasibility of the OCP. One team believes it would take 200 of these devices 130 years to collect merely 5% of all plastic in the oceans. Every year we produce 380 million tons of plastic. 275 million tons of this end up as waste, 79% of which go to the landfill or the ocean. Recycling, sure. Bioplastics, sure. Ocean cleanups, sure. But I see no adequate way of tackling plastic pollution that doesn't involve simply producing less plastic. But plastic is so profitable. There's the rub. Like, that's why we're speeding towards our doom. Because in the world we find ourselves in, things don't happen because they're good, useful, or necessary. If that was the case, we would have solved the climate crisis by now. We wouldn't even have one in the first place. No, things happen because they're profitable. And unfortunately, it's more profitable to pollute and overexploit nature than to not do that. There's a reason fossil fuel billionaires push so hard against environmental regulations, because for them to clean up their mess is an expense they would rather externalize and let someone else deal with in order to maximize profits. But it's not just fossil fuel companies though, everybody's out to maximize profit, and everybody's cutting corners, and the environment is an easy corner to cut. And of course, the whole system depends on growth. I, I made a video about that a few months ago, remember? And that's why we have a climate crisis. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. That's right on the money. Pardon the expression. While Boyan Slot's machine is a band aid on a gaping wound, this is at least a correct diagnosis. Like, look, there's a gaping wound. And there's data and science to back this up. Pretty much everybody acknowledges that rising GDP has historically entailed higher consumption of energy, resources, and materials, along with environmental damage. 
but some people hope that slapping green in front of growth will magically fix everything. And here we get to the most dangerous form of techno-optimism, because it's not just confined to IPCC scientists and regular Joes and Joannes. No, this is the techno-optimism of the most powerful people and institutions in the world. The OECD, UNEP, and the World Bank are all counting on technology becoming ever more energy and resource efficient, because that way we can continue to grow GDP without negative impacts on the environment. That's the idea behind green growth. Problem is... I've said this two times already. There's no empirical support for this working. There's a physical limit to the efficiency gains technology can make, and once we hit those limits, rising GDP will again mean more material consumption and environmental damage. Despite claims here and there that the materialization of the economy has led to peak stuff or peak emissions, the economy is as materially dependent and polluting as ever, arguably even more in the 21st century than in the 20th. The idea of green growth exists because abandoning economic growth as the very measure of progress and well-being, that would change everything. And that's not what the people in power want. And now we can understand why people and scientists are pushing for nuclear fusion and Bex and so on. These solutions don't rock the boat. They're not too politically inconvenient. They don't challenge capitalism. All these solutions, in theory, allow for continued green economic growth. But again, green growth doesn't work. Even the technologies I like, namely solar and wind, also suffer from this. Their share in the energy mix is indeed growing fast, but it's highly unlikely they can be rolled out fast enough to make the 1.5 or 2 degree targets, assuming continued economic growth. Not to mention that getting to 100% renewables in a green growth scenario by 2060 would require a lot of minerals. For some, like silver and tin, it would require more than are currently known to exist. There's simply no getting around the need to use less energy. But I'm not talking about individualist shit like, oh, please remember to turn off the lights when you leave the room, and also don't play video games because that's such a power hog. Go outside and play with a stick instead. That's eco-friendly, and that's what caring for Mother Earth is all about. No, I'm talking about big picture, structural, societal level stuff. Like, remember the whole unprecedented transitions in all aspects of society? The only scenario in the October 2018 report that goes completely without BEX is one where energy consumption drops by 40%, a low energy demand scenario. LED, uh, I, I, I get it. This scenario does assume rising GDP, but by the author's own admission, that's sad. The paper doesn't look into questions of GDP and rebound effects, aka Jevons paradox, or the growth, and they admit that's a drawback. But the scenario highlights something simple and straightforward. The more energy we can save, the less energy we use, the better our chances for getting to 100% renewables quickly. However, reducing energy use challenges the growth imperative inherent to our system. This is something many people either miss or ignore. I want to stress again that I'm not against technology. Technology can be used for good. Technology can reduce working hours, technology can help us in tracking planetary health, and of course technology is essential for the very science that made us aware of the climate crisis in the first place. And yes, we can make technology more resource and energy efficient, and we should do that, like that. I think that's dope. I'm all for that, just don't get carried away while praising technology. The dangerous allure of techno-optimism is that we can just continue to live as we do now, just better, faster, and greener. But in a society driven by the profit motive, technology will invariably be used towards that end, and thus preserve the environmentally destructive status quo. And the technologies I've brought up in this video, like none of them do anything about unequal power structures or anything. With the exception of solar and wind, not only are they crucial technologies we definitely need more of, they can potentially subvert the capitalist order in key ways. How so? Well, think about a coal, oil, gas, or even a nuclear or hypothetical fusion plant. What do they have in common? They are centralized forms of energy production. Lots of energy are made at one place and then distributed wherever people can pay for it. This means a few individuals can own these plants and thus make a lot of money. Indeed, some of the richest people in the world made their fortunes this way and are currently using those fortunes to decimate democracy. The way we currently produce energy amounts to a literal and figurative concentration of power. 
Solar and wind, on the other hand, are decentralized forms of energy production that can be owned at a local level or even by individuals without obscene amounts of capital. For these reasons, Bill McKibben argues in Falter that solar power in particular could be a technology of repair, social as well as environmental. Even as it heals the atmosphere, it can help reduce that chunk of inequality that derives from the control of oil and gas deposits. Now, McKibben acknowledges the limitations of these technologies. They're not as powerful or dense as fossil fuels or nuclear. You can't make a lot of energy from them at one place. They need to be distributed over a large area to work. We can't simply shoehorn them into our current growth-obsessed system and imagine the world is saved. But rather than seeing this as a drawback, he sees this as an asset. Again, talking specifically about solar. Solar power accelerates the transition toward a smaller scale world less obsessed with efficiency. Because it comes from everywhere, it gives everywhere the chance to provide for more of its own needs. Over half a century ago, Murray Bookchin saw similar potential in solar and wind, and again viewed its limits as a positive. But he went a step further. Limitations of scope could represent a profound advantage from an ecological point of view. The sun, the wind, and the earth are experiential realities to which men have responded sensuously and reverently from time immemorial. Out of these primal elements, man developed his sense of dependence on, and respect for, the natural environment, a dependence that kept his destructive activities in check. The Industrial Revolution obscured nature's role in the human experience. Man's dependence on the natural world became invisible. It became theoretical and intellectual in character. We became alienated from nature. To bring the sun, the wind, the earth, indeed the world of life back into technology, into the means of human survival, would be a revolutionary renewal of man's ties to nature. So, regarding solar and wind, you can call me a techno-optimist. Because no one owns the sun or the wind, these technologies can turn energy into something more like a commons, something owned by everybody rather than just a few. I'd go so far as to say that solar and wind present a way to seize the means of energy production. Recognizing that green growth is a pipe dream changes the role that technology should play in tackling the climate crisis. It goes from playing a lead role to a supporting role. And the lead role instead goes to us, the people. We need to fight for a world where everybody can have their needs met and thrive, and within planetary boundaries. I truly believe we can create a better world through tackling the climate crisis, and technology will certainly play a role in bringing that better world about. But currently, we live under a socioeconomic system that constantly demands more, and techno-optimism both feeds from and feeds into that system, at great risk to ourselves, to nature, and to our non-human comrades. Degrowth is our only option.